you know, reading can be a way that somebody really connects with an important issue or cause, and it transforms people. Renee Denfeld was born with the heart of a warrior and the soul of a poet. Denfeld had what some would call a tough life, but nothing would keep her knocked down. When she became a parent, writing about it in the New York Times, by adopting from foster care, I became the mother I had needed and rewrote my own story. I got to have a childhood all over again, the right one, filled with cuddles and perseverance, safety and love. If there is such a thing as a cycle of abuse, I broke it over the wheel of my own desire. Tackling hard subjects with empathy has become Denfeld's forte as she opens readers' minds to lives dissimilar to their own. And accolades follow with each novel Denfeld writes. And now she's written Sleeping Giants. Leading tonight's discussion is fellow author Stephanie Oakes. Please welcome both of them back to the Northwest Passages stage. everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I want to thank Christy for putting all of this on. She does such an amazing job. Everybody who works with Northwest Passages, um, Rob, even though he can't be here, um, Johnny, Jesse, the whole crew, um, the bar, and Andrea and aunties, um, and everyone who was involved in making this event. Um, my book launch for the Meadows, which was in September, was done through Northwest Passages, and they just do such a nice job. And um, yeah, I'm just so happy to have been invited back to be here. Um, so we'll get started. This is Renee Denfeld, and I'm so excited to speak to her. Her books are amazing. Um, our, our audience might already know you from your books, like The Child Finder and The Butterfly Girl, and now your newest book, Sleeping Giants. But beyond your books, can you tell us a little more about yourself and your background? Sure. Can you guys hear me okay? I tend to be soft-spoken, so if you need me to speak up or get my tire, just say something. Um, I am so honored to be here. I have this vivid memory, I think it was 2019, I came here for the Butterfly Girl, and it was at the Bing. And oh my goodness, it was a, just a transformational event for me, and it just sticks in my mind so much of what it's like to have a community come together around a book and a subject and to learn and talk and discuss in such a hopeful way. So um, it just meant the world to me, and I'm hopeful that we can do that again tonight. Um, I know I, my work deals with some really serious stuff, but when you read Sleeping Giants, you'll see it actually has a very happy ending because I'm all about the hope. And it's something that I've um, found in my own life. So. Um, yeah, you asked about a little bit of background about me. Yeah. Yeah, so um, as mentioned in that really beautiful little video, I have a very difficult backstory. I was raised um, in a great deal of poverty and neglect uh, with a mother that was alcoholic, uh, badly so, when I was young. And I ended up being homeless as a young teenager. Uh, I lived on the streets of downtown Portland because, to be honest, the streets were safer than my own home, which I think says something. I uh, had a lot of very traumatic experiences, as you can imagine. One thing I discovered, though, was the library was my sanctuary. I spent all my time in the downtown Portland library. I had gotten in the habit of going into libraries as a young girl because they were always safe. And so I have a vivid memory, for instance, of being in the downtown Portland library on my 15th birthday. And I remember all the rain coming down the windows. And I, 
I had made my own little circle of books, like I often did, on the table. So uh, from a very early age, stories and books became my sanctuary and my hope. Uh, they also became a place where I learned that life could be different. You know, through learning the stories of other people, I realized my life could be different. And so a lot of times nowadays when I'm speaking uh, to people, particularly like parent groups and educators, I talk about the power, the power of imagination which I believe is our real resiliency. We talk about resiliency a lot in our culture, and for me, imagination is the real resiliency. Because when we have an imagination, we can imagine a different future. And that's what I did. So long story short, I, I got off the streets and ended up having a couple very interesting different careers. What are some of the careers that you have had? Um, I, I hope I'm not giving too much feedback here. Tell me, am I holding it too close? Anything? I'm okay? All right. So um, initially, uh, after I got off the streets, I uh, had a variety of different kind of jobs just to, to survive. I ended up going into journalism because that was something I could do without a degree. And uh, I ended up becoming a foster and adoptive parent. I adopted three amazing kids from the state foster system, and I fostered others as well. And then eventually, I ended up going into justice work. And I became a licensed investigator in the state of Oregon, and ended up being the chief investigator at a public defender's office. Uh, so, and I'm happy to talk more about that. I've worked hundreds of cases. I've worked death row cases. Uh, helped rape trafficking victims. It's an amazing job because I get to help people, and I think that's part of what gives me my hope because I feel like I'm engaged in the process of, of making change. And every day I get to see the, the power and the beauty of people that are actually changing. So I'm actually, I know that I'm talking about a bunch of stuff that's really heavy and grim, but. I actually think I'm very much an optimistic person, and if you knew me in real life, you'd be like, oh, she's like, that woman's so damn cheerful all the time. <laughs> I am. My, my kids know me as somebody that's always, you know, going for a walk and then making cookies, you know? Yeah, I've had, I've had coworkers or people that know me mm -hmm. who found out that I write and then went out and read some of my books and then came back and said, like, I can't believe you wrote that. That was really dark. Um, <laughs> so I, I can kind of relate to that. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? Because um, I don't know what it is. I think there's an assumption if you deal with real serious topics that you're going to be a grim and difficult person. But actually, maybe by dealing with grim and serious topics, it gives us a sense of, of making change. And, you know, I think I'm actually a more cheerful and optimistic person than a lot of people out there. Yeah. And yeah. It, it can be cathartic to write about it, too. Yeah, exactly. You feel it. And, you know, it gives you a chance to talk. I think we need more stories about people and populations and things that we often don't know about. And like, you know, you've written about conversion therapy. That's yeah. really important stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I was also saved by the public library system as a kid, um, and I sought books out as a child and, uh, as a way of escape, and um, I knew pretty early on that I wanted my name on a book. Um, I'd like imagined that even mm -hmm. way before I started writing my own stories. So I wondered how did, um, how did that experience prompt you, or, or what prompted you to write your own books? Well, you know, for me it was, yeah, from a young age, I always wanted to be a writer. I did. I, I would read those books in the library, and I would imagine what would it be like if I could be a writer. Is it the feedback OK? OK. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, so yeah, I used to imagine it, but I had this idea that people from my background couldn't become writers. I thought if you were a writer, you had a den. And <laughs> that was my idea. And you lived in Maine, <laughs> on, you know, and you had a lakeshore cabin. I don't know. I literally was convinced that you had to come from that kind of socioeconomic background to be a writer. So uh, for the longest time, I thought I couldn't. 
And I, you know, I did end up going into journalism, which taught me the skill set of craft. But I didn't write my first novel until I was actually in my 40s. And there's a lot to be said, I think, for, at least in my case, for waiting uh, until I felt like I had the wisdom and experience. Uh, and it took that long for me to feel confident enough in my voice to feel like my voice counts too. Yeah, I've, I, I was in my 20s when my first book came out, but I, I have thought, I really was just teaching myself mm -hmm. how to write as I was mm -hmm. writing these books, and I just lucked out that my first book was picked up by a publisher, but I've, I feel like I'm still figuring out kind of where my authorial voice is, and that it, a reader who read my first book might not not enjoy my, my later books. So yeah, I kind of, I kind of relate yeah. to that. I'm still figuring it out. <laughs> Isn't it true like the older you get, the less you know? Maybe that's part of being a parent, you know. <laughs> you get to hear about all the times you're wrong. <laughs> well, let's jump into talking about Sleeping Giants. Um, Sleeping Giants was praised by Booklist as a transfixingly atmospheric, brilliantly plotted, heart-seizing drama of cruelty and trauma, cover-ups and murder, and the depthless mysteries of pain and love. Can you tell us more about what people can expect from Sleeping Giants? Sure, so this book really came from the heart. It's very much a labor of love. And it starts, the, the opening scene is of a young boy, he's nine years old, and he's down on a Oregon beach and for those of you that aren't familiar with our coastline, it is not a place you go play in the ocean. It's, and he's on this very remote stretch of very inhospitable surf where there's all these warning signs about sneaker waves and undertoes, don't go near the water. And it starts with a scene of this little boy charging into these waves and he drowns and is gone missing, is presumed dead. Um, and from there, the story actually jumps forward 20 years when a young woman named Amanda, who is adopted as a newborn, learns about this brother that she had, who is that little boy. And she goes on a search to find out more about him. What was he doing at the beach? She learns that he was actually in, lived in a residential home for troubled children on the Oregon coast. And so as this young woman, Amanda, starts this process of trying to find out more about her brother, she kind of unwittingly runs headfirst into decades of secrets and crimes that have been hidden. Uh, so me, for me, it's a, it's a story about what happens in these residential homes. This is all factually based, I'm sorry to say. Um, there's half a million foster children in this country and a lot of this book is inspired by my own experiences of, as a foster and adoptive parent about what, sadly enough, can happen to a lot of them. Um, but it's also a story about how one person can make a difference, and that's what Amanda does. Just one curious woman. She's not, you know, a hard-boiled detective. She's, she's an everyday average person who goes on a search for the truth. Yeah, one of my favorite little uh, subplots of this book was had to do with the polar bear, which you, you will get to find out what that is when you read the book. Um, so let's talk more about the, um, the foster care system since this features so heavily in this book. Um, when I was reading this, I was getting, picking up on some similarities to your Child Finder series. Mm -hmm. um, and in that series, the protagonist, Naomi, searches for missing children and, and oftentimes the children that she's searching for are in well-publicized cases that are in the news. Mm -hmm. um, but in Sleeping Giants, you focus on what the book describes as the unmissing, the estimated 20,000 children who have gone missing from the foster care system. How did you come to center the story on the unmissing? You know, there's something that kind of came up in the process of the book. It's something I was I'm familiar with as a foster and adoptive parent, and I don't think it gets the attention it deserves. But basically, when children enter foster care, they kind of vanish into the system. And because of confidentiality laws, when a foster kid goes missing, you can't put it, their name on the news. You can't disseminate any information about them. The police can't, in some cases, the police don't even tell their biological parents that they're missing. 
And if you go to a, like a clearinghouse for missing children on the, the web, their names won't be there because of the, all the confidentiality laws. So over the years, what's happened is thousands of foster kids have gone missing. And oftentimes, even one state doesn't tell another state. Like, so if a foster kid in Washington went missing, the people in Oregon, the government, you know, the police down there wouldn't even hear about it. So you have a system which is unfortunately kind of primed for children to get exploited or hurt or to go missing and have, there's been, I won't go into detail because it's very traumatic, but there's been very high profile, not high profile cases, but terrible cases where foster kids have gone missing and nobody even knew they were missing until the body was located. Um, so I kind of wanted to shed a little bit of light on this subject that, you know, for every high profile missing child you see on the news, there's hundreds of kids that go missing from the, the system and people don't even hear about them. Yeah, this was my first time learning about this. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the major settings in Sleeping Giants is this group home for boys on the Oregon coast. Um, and it's here that we meet Dennis, who's the missing boy at the heart of the story. Um, when I was reading the book, I was struck by the brutality of this group home. And also, in, in some ways, Dennis experiences love and connection for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the way that you depicted it, the brutality, felt both shocking to me and very real. Um, and I assumed that there must have been quite a bit of research involved. So I was curious about what your research process was like for this book and if it was different from your previous books. You know, it was, um, there was research involved. So one of the things that happens to Dennis, he's, and when he's four years old, he's actually sent to this place. It's called Brightwood, and it's a residential home for troubled boys. And this unfortunately happens to a lot of kids in the foster system because there's always a crisis shortage of foster parents. And so uh, Dennis does, he experiences, these places are never, you know, I'll just be honest with you, I just don't think an orphanage is ever an appropriate place for a child. It, it can be the nicest orphanage in the world and it's not a way that children should be raised because children need love. And what Dennis experiences at this institution is often terrible. Um, and there are shreds, he's, for instance, he's befriended by a very kind-hearted custodian. So there's love there too. Uh, but unfortunately, when Dennis is seven, a key part of the book, what comes up is a new director is hired. And this director is a proponent of a very draconian treatment method. And she brings this to Brightwood, and that is a turning point, unfortunately, in Dennis's life. So there's, you know, I had to do a fair amount of research into these centers because I had some personal experience with them, but I wanted to make sure everything was grounded in reality. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there's nothing graphic in this book. I'm very careful with that. I always try to be super respectful to victims. I think that even fictional victims deserve a lot of respect. And when I'm writing a story like this, one method, I'd be curious to, to hear how, how you deal with this, but one method I do is if I'm writing about something traumatic happening to someone, I like to imagine that when I'm done, I'm giving the pages to that fictional victim. And I ask them, how do you feel about the way I portrayed what happened to you? Because I want to feel like my work is very respectful of victims and that I'm never um, writing anything that's salacious or exploitative. And I also don't want to traumatize my readers. Um, so I know that you've written about really difficult things like conversion therapy. So how do you handle that? Yeah, um, my last book was, it's, it's a dystopian novel, so it's, it's, it's not supposed to be exactly what happens in the U.S., but it's definitely a commentary on conversion therapy and mm -hmm. the fact that it still happens today. Um, and my goal, I guess a, a secondary goal, was sort of what, what came out of this book, Sleeping Giants, was to have people like kind of perk up and, and say like, oh, I didn't know that was still happening. And, mm -hmm. and conversion therapy is very much still happening, even in states like Washington, where it's supposedly banned. Um, so yeah, I think what you said kind of reminded me of, I've 
almost feel like I have a relationship with the characters, and mm -hmm. if, I, if I step away from them for a long time, I feel guilty. Um, <laughs> like I have a, a book that I'm working on currently that I have, have stepped away from for like a week, and I just keep thinking about them and thinking that I've, I've left them, I've left them alone. <laughs> It's, um, it's hard when you finish, too, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, although uh, parts of me are really ready to be done <laughs> when I'm done with the book. Um, but I like, I've, I've never done what you said, but I like, I like that idea. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, and actually the, the treatment method this director of Brightwood uses actually, interestingly enough, has also been used in conversion therapy. So, you know, for me, a lot of this story, too, is it's an examination of the harm that people commit when they think they're doing the right thing. And that's, I think that's an important subject. Yeah. Um, well, I, I had never heard of holding time before I read this book. Um, and I was, I was curious what, what inspired you to include it other than kind of what you've already spoken to that mm -hmm. um, it's happening and, and people don't know or is it still happening? I, I wasn't yeah. sure. So yeah, the therapy, it's called holding time which is a very gentle sounding phrase for something that's actually, it's physical and psychological torture basically. It's designed to break children down and it is it's still happening. In fact, I just saw a journal article and I think it's a journal of child psychiatry last month talking about how it's still being used. Um, and I think, you know, it's always interesting as a writer, sometimes I don't, you know, I don't know why we're, we're, we're drawn to certain things and subjects. I think for me, it was a chance to kind of delve into like when people, because you see this kind of throughout our history, right? It's like if you're talking about slavery or the Holocaust or genocides or forced sterilization or conversion therapy, all the ways that people hurt other people while they believe they're doing the right thing. And this just really intrigues me. And holding time seemed like a really good example of that because this woman who's doing this horrible therapy really believes that she's doing the right thing. Um, and so it's a chance to kind of dive into that, like what are the real motives under those things and what would our society be like if we could just admit when we're doing something wrong, right? I think about that a lot because we live in a society where there's so much defensiveness and it's just so hard for us collectively and individually to say I was wrong or we were wrong, let's fix our mistake. And so in in Sleeping Giants, this director, instead of admitting she was wrong, she kind of doubles down and commits even more harm. And so I think that's kind of what really pulled me into that, is like wanting to dig into her character and, and kind of look at that individual as a more global example of this thing that we all have the capacity for. Yeah, the, this director character, uh, I, I kind of, when I'm reading books, I sort of like take them apart mm -hmm. and really try to understand how an author did what they were doing. And that was one of the things I was struck with reading this book was that the way you wrote this villainous character, she is a villain, mm -hmm. and she elicited a lot of emotional response in me, but, but you described her almost like with compassion and, ha and like mm -hmm. really, so we understood her perspective, um, even while she's doing these heinous, things. Mm -hmm. um, and when I, when I was in my very first creative writing class, I, uh, I asked my professor, how do you write a good villain? And he sat and thought for like a long time, it was like this older professor, and he said, you have to love them. Mm -hmm. And that was, the, that was the only thing he said. He would just like drop the mic and <laughs> class was done. Um, but that's mm -hmm. just lived in my head. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't always know that we have to love them, but we do have to understand them. And I felt like you really had understood this yeah. villain. Yeah, thank you. I, I think you do. And, you know, it's one thing that happens a lot in modern day storytelling, I think, is we tend to other the villain. We like to create these villains who are total, complete sociopaths, right? And they're dancing around in suits they make out of people's skins or you know, eating their liver for lunch with a nice Chianti, right? And I can see the appeal of that, but it's kind of creating a cartoon villain, right? And it has this 
effect of kind of putting violence and harm as outside us. And it makes it look like it's those guys and we're harmless and helpless and that's not us. But I think in, in truth, and it's something I'm trying to examine in my work, is we all have this capacity for harm and sometimes we're even, you know, we're not even aware of it or we don't intend it to be. And by othering the perpetrator, we can kind of avoid looking at the social causes of harm. And, you know, my justice work a lot is I see a lot of the social causes. And that doesn't take away from the perpetrator's accountability at all. You know, because I'm a survivor and I believe that people need to be accountable for their acts. But at the same time, I, I, I would like to prevent those things. And we can't prevent what we don't understand. So, yeah, for me, this is the villain. She's definitely a villain. But she, like all of us, is a human being. And she has motives that she herself won't even examine. She won't look inside. And I, so, and, and I have compassion for that. And it, at the same time, um, I believe that people like that need to be held accountable as well. We can have both. <laughs> so something that I have noticed in, in all of your books is, is the way that you write about trauma. Mm -hmm. You do so with such authenticity and compassion. And there's this line from The Child Finder. When I was reading it, I stopped what I was doing and wrote it down. And it says, we are all part of a secret club. It will be people like us who save the world those who have walked the side of sorrow and seen the dawn. Um, and as a writer and a survivor mm -hmm. of, of childhood abuse and trauma myself, I've, I've never written directly about my own experiences mm -hmm. in fiction. I've sort of written around. Um, and I feel kind of intimidated to mm -hmm. tackle it head on. Um, it feels big and, mm -hmm. and difficult. And so I was wondering, um, could you speak to how you approach writing about trauma? in your work? Oh, wow, you know, it's, it's so important to me because I think we all experience trauma. You know, it's just part of life, right? You can't avoid it. You, you lose a sibling, you lose a loved one, you get fired at work, you know, there's, it, it, you know, that we all experience sadness and grief and harm. So for me, these things are all kind of woven through our life. and. It's, it fascinates me how in our culture we take certain kinds of trauma and we put them in like little areas over here and there, uh, particularly um, certain kinds of crimes. I think we, we, there's a lot of shaming around those. And I know that, like, for instance, like the fact that I was homeless as a, as a child, I was ashamed of that for a long time. And so I tried to keep it secret. I remember I would get these jobs, like, you know, when I started working in the public defender's office, everybody always kind of assumes you have a degree, and that was a job that didn't require one. I never was dishonest or anything. But I'd be in the break room, and people would be talking about their high school prom and things, and I would always be kind of trying to edge. <laughs> I didn't want people to know my past because I was ashamed of my trauma. You know, but what if we were in a society where people didn't have to feel ashamed? And I don't want the victims in my books to feel ashamed either. So I think that's kind of my approach is I, like my, with my children, my children from foster care, they, they came to me with a lot of really terrible things that happened to them, but I'm not ashamed for them. I'm proud of them. I tell them all the time, I love you for everything you are, including everything that's ever happened to you, not despite it, including it. So when I'm working on books, I think I kind of have the same attitude towards the victims in my stories and the survivors. I love those characters for everything that's happened to them, including all the bad stuff. And maybe since I'm not ashamed of what happened to them, they don't have to be ashamed either. That's great. Um, one, one thing I think about a lot when I'm writing something that feels like it, it could tip exploitative of the characters mm -hmm. or of the subject matter or um, uh, melodramatic, which mm -hmm. I think is always it's, it's a fear when you're writing about these big, heavy subjects, is um, like my approach to it. I, I heard this quote a long time ago about writing about 
big issues and the quote, mm -hmm. I think it was Richard Price, um, mm -hmm. and he said, you don't write about the big thing, you find the smallest thing you can mm -hmm. write about. So you don't write about the horrors of war, mm -hmm. you write about a child's burnt socks on the mm -hmm. side of the road. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that it takes this really deft hand to mm -hmm. write about these subjects in a way that doesn't tip tip melodramatic mm -hmm. or, or exploitative and you really walk that line so oh, so well you. in all of your books thank you yeah and I think it is um you know also having to be honest with ourselves as writers too don't you think I mean we always have to I had an editor once who 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 said I'm going to ask you the most terrible and important question that any writer can ask themselves and she she said what is this story really about and so I always ask myself that, and I try really hard to be honest with myself. I don't know how you deal with this, too, but I try hard to be honest, like, why am I writing this story, and what is it really about for me? Yeah, when I, was, when I first started out writing, it was, it was really just focused on the plot and the characters mm -hmm. and these sort of things on the surface. And, and I think you do, when you're, when you're first starting out, that, that is what you need to focus on. And now... It's like I'm down in the, the bedrock, and I feel like there's a big question at the center of, of all of my books that I'm trying to find the answer to. So for my last book, it was, it was trauma and how mm -hmm. this, and this conversion therapy center, how this like, kind of identical trauma plays out differently in, all of, in the lives of all these different girls. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that is now like the, my like, tr like true north. That's my, mm -hmm. like, what I'm always orienting to when I'm mm -hmm. writing is that like, the big why. Yeah, and when we know the why, then the beautiful thing is I found like when I know the why of my story, then the ending naturally creates itself because mm -hmm. the ending has to be the answer to the question. Mm -hmm. And so in Sleeping Giant, I have all these characters and they're, I think they're, they're searching for love and connection. You, you mentioned there's a polar bear in the story. This is my first book that actually has animal characters. And, and so, I, and, it, and I love it because, you know, people don't, you know, we, we make family, and, but we don't just make family with each other. We make family with the creatures in our lives, our pets and our animal family. So, so yeah, the, you know, I started asking myself the questions of the book, and then it naturally leads to the answer, you know. And then that, that way you can have an ending that, that really kind of sums it up. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to ask a question that, that is of interest to me, um, <laughs> and that's a, a craft question. Um, I read that your, your fiction has been described as thrillers that read like poems, which mm -hmm. I think is just a really perfect way to describe mm -hmm. your writing. Um, and as a writer, I really I admire the page turny quality mm -hmm. of your books, and many of your reviews people say, I finished this in one day or in one sitting. Oh my god, that drives me crazy. Don't tell me that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do, do, have you ever gotten that? Well, I never thought I would write a page turner. Yeah. Um, and for my first book, my editor said, this mm -hmm. is this is going to be a page turner. We're going to turn this into a page turner together. So when I heard that, I thought, like, okay, I did my job. I, I, <laughs> I, I checked that box. Um, but, yeah, I know, I know what you mean. Um, well, yeah, you know, because people say that, and I think, that book took me two years to write. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you finish it in a day. This yeah. is not fair. <laughs> But I finish books in a day, too, so I get it. <laughs> um, so I admire that aspect mm -hmm. of your writing, but my personal delight is mm -hmm. in the language. Um, and I feel like your writing is so stunning, and there's so many turns of phrase mm -hmm. that are, like, breath-catching. Um, and I just always love asking writers about the craft of writing, so mm -hmm. I'd love to hear about how you go about writing with such beauty and clarity. Oh, thank you. You know, I think one of the, the benefits is I of my background, and I, you know, as time passed, I see all these strengths that I got from my, my own personal history. And one is I learned to write by reading. And because I'm a voracious reader, I just absorb, you know, every time you read a book, whether you know it or not, you're absorbing. You absorb the craft, you absorb structure, narrative. And so kind of like a self-taught musician, I learned all these things. I didn't know the names for them. But I think I, I picked up a lot from that but at the same time, I didn't, because I wasn't formally educated, I didn't have anybody telling me what was right or wrong. So I think that allowed me to develop my own voice. Um, and I, I just love language. You know, for me, when I'm writing, it's the most beautiful experience. I feel like it's through story, I believe that 
we connect with this kind of this sense of sublime. And as a writer, when I'm writing this story, I'm kind of in the sublime. And then as a reader, when I'm reading a story, I'm in the sublime. And it's, it's almost a spiritual kind of thing for me. I think that we, story is just this massive kind of democratic place where we all meet. And like you might not, you know, I, I've read books by writers I, that have no idea that I read their book, but in some way we met. And I just think it's the most beautiful thing. So the more that I connect with that sense of beauty and joy and wonder inside the story, I think, that's when my writing, that's when my writing goes well. Um, and as far as, yeah, as far as the craft of it, um, it's, it is that strange thing where you have to, um, you abandon yourself to the story. And sometimes it goes well and sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> you know? yeah. Yes. Yeah, so what is your day-to-day -day writing life like? What's what's your writing process? You know, it's it's it kind of comes and goes. It changes. I still have my day job. I'm still a licensed investigator. I do that work. Uh, my children are now uh, pretty much all empty nested. In fact, I have a grandbaby, which is so exciting. Um, so I have a lot more freedom than I used to have. My first novel, I wrote that literally, I would take my laptop with me to work and I would, or like I'd take a kid to the dentist and I would write in the dentist office. So I, um, I don't really have a structured routine. I write when, when I'm working on a book, I write when I can. And, um, but I am also very, um, very disciplined about it. I've discovered for myself that I need to be disciplined. And so if I don't feel like writing and I have time, I make myself. I'll just edit, you know, what I wrote the day before sort of thing. So um, I know that a lot of, that might not be a satisfying answer because there's writers out there that have all these like magic rituals and, and I don't. I just open the laptop and I, I hope it goes well. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think we've reached the end of our conversation portion. It was so nice to, to chat with you. Oh, I think we're going to do some audience questions now. Thank you. This has been wonderful. I really appreciate you guys coming and listening to this. Yep. Audience questions are some of the funnest parts, or the funnest part. Mm -hmm. uh, there are kids in the audience tonight and students. Um, students come to all of our events for free. Uh, there was a uh, regular at Northwest Passage, his name was Owen Muir, and uh, since he's passed and he was a student of life, all of the students that want to come to a Northwest Passages event get in. Now, I'm not gravitating towards students over here that might want a question. There might be one over there, I'm just saying. Uh, don't be shy. This is your opportunity to ask the authors or play stump the writers. Either one will take your questions. I like that, stump the writers. Yeah, stump the writers. <laughs> It was such an, a, a, an incredible conversation following all of that. Uh, no, please, uh, this is always my favorite part, too. I want to hear people. Hi, thank you so much for being here. How does the title of your book tie in to the story? Oh, that's a great question. So I'll make it quick. Part of the story uh, involves... And this, actually, there's a, there's a story I have from my justice work. I had to go to a prison on the border of Arizona and California. I, I visit a lot of prisons and find witnesses, and I'll go do a DNA test, that kind of thing. So in this, I was in this remote desert out in Arizona, and there's these, I found these things. They're called sleeping giants. And they're these Stone Age carvings that people made a long time ago. Nobody knows when or where they came from, but they're giant carvings that were carved into the rock of the desert floor. And there are these giant figurines of people and animals. So those are actually, they come up in the book of the Sleeping Giants. And what I realized as I was writing the book is it ended up being kind of a, a metaphor for me of those unexamined motives and reasons that people have for committing harm. It became this metaphorical thing as I was writing, and it's probably not obvious in the book, but for me it became like, what are our sleeping giants? Why do we do things that hurt each other that we might not be aware of? Thank you for asking that. One of the things that you might notice also as well is we've got the cameras going, and so there is a live stream. We haven't figured out how to get questions from the live stream audience <laughs> yet, but one that I know is popular, particularly when both of you were talking about being voracious readers, is what's on your TBR pile right now? Or what are you looking forward to reading? I have some of her books in That's my right. bag. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, that's a lovely parting gift. You do have the meadows in your bag. 
<laughs> I, yeah, they, they, gave, uh, they, they gave me this amazing swag bag with, with books in it, so I know what I'm going to be doing. <laughs> How about you? Um, let's see. Oh, so many. So many books. Um, if, you're, if you follow me on Instagram, I'm doing a new thing where I um, put 20 titles, books that I don't own that I want to read in a cup, and then I pull one out every month. Um, so last month was this book called Briefly a Delicious Life, which is it's about a ghost um, from the 1400s who like haunts George Sand um, when she goes on this retreat in Mallorca. It sounds really out there, but it was it was excellent. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to be doing another one of those next month. So you can come find me on Instagram <laughs> and find out what that one is. Um, but I also read the first one of this series called The Wolf Den, which takes place in Pompeii. Um, and I loved it. I loved the first one, um, and there's two more books in the series, so those are going to be my next reads, I think. Question back here. Hi. Uh, thank you for being here, and I was wondering how you two deal with uh, creative block. Uh, I'm an illustrator primarily, but an artist as well, and I know that that's something that I struggle with frequently, so I was just wondering if you two have any specific methods that you use to manage, you know, when you sit down and stare at, you know, an open document or open page mm -hmm. and nothing is coming out. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Do you want to go first? Uh, yeah. Oh, I have a lot of things to say about this because this still happens to me regularly. Um, I, I kind of feel like I'm starting over every day. And sometimes I have momentum from the previous day. And sometimes I'm like zero miles an hour, like I'm, I'm stuck. Um, and so there's a few things I've tried. Um, one, I can, I've, I've done it a few times, so I have a better sense of when I'm stuck because, um, because I'm just in that sort of uh, frozen state of staring at the blank page, or if it's because what I'm working on just really isn't working. So that kind of like intuition that you develop, the more that you do it. Um, I have a bit more now. Um, also, th things like morning pages, if you've read The Artist's Way, um, sitting down and writing three pages of stream of consciousness, just dumping out anything in your brain, can kind of like grease the wheels and get you going. Um, but also just trying, like sitting and trying and putting anything down on the page. Um, this book that I'm working on now, I just felt like it was like a few months of just like, I don't know what this is. I'm just throwing random things in the story. And then like finally, like all of these puzzle pieces that were scattered on the table started to click together. And that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't just shown up every day anyway and, and tried to make it work. Those are all great. Are you, now you said you're an illustrator. Yeah. And I don't want to put him on the spot, but he is drawing at the same time. He's multitasking. <laughs> he's, he's, he's feeling the creative urge while, while yeah. he's here. So you're uh, primary, primarily illustrating? Yes. Yeah. Do you do writing as well or? On occasion? Yeah. I'm, I'm asking because I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm not as familiar with illustrating and, and how it would work. But now I was thinking, and sometimes, and this, this might be very counterintuitive, but the other thing I do is, is trying to develop that discernment of like, maybe this isn't working for me for a reason. Um, but I also will, if I'm having a really hard time, I'll just take a conscious break. And I'll say I'm not going to do any writing for a week or two weeks or whatever it is. And I also think about input-output, because for me it's really important that I feed my soul with other art. Like for a huge part of my writing practice is I go to see a lot of live theater. I like to go to little tiny independent theaters where they're like, you're so close to the actors, they're pretty much like bumping your knees. Um, and so, and I, I just like to s sit in this room with actors and a lot of the plays aren't very good, you know, sometimes. <laughs> sometimes they're brilliant, but it's just, I just, it kind of resets my mind because I'm hearing story in a different form. Or I'll go look, go to a museum and look at a bunch of art. And that, that's kind of a way of resetting for me. It's like, oh, that's a different perspective to look at art. Yeah. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Right back there. Yes, mom. <laughs> <laughs> you Are talking? you mom? Yeah, I'm mom. Oh, hi. hi. Nice to meet you. Hi, mom. <laughs> Time, and that's a term I had no idea what it is. Holding time. You talked about what is it, or can you? 
Yeah, yeah you know, I apologize. I didn't want to get too graphic or detailed about it. So um, holding time is a so-called therapy method that is still practiced in the United States. It became popular decades ago. And in short, it involves um, physical, and, physical and psychological restraint and um, coercion. Um, to the point where there's been at least six known child fatalities that have been associated with this treatment method. Um, children are basically uh, physically restrained and smothered. Um, and the idea is that they're going to be broken down and their defenses are going to be, but it's extremely physically dangerous. Has zero scientific backing. In fact, reputable scientists have completely denounced this treatment method. And yet it is still used today, much like conversion therapy, where you know reputable scientists have said this is a terrible thing to do to somebody. Um, it psychologically just destroys people, destroys children. So um, I was kind of hopeful that the book will bring more attention to that. Yeah. yeah. The, both of our authors will be available afterwards to sign their books that are here. This is the part of the evening where there's the raffle where uh, everybody is automatically entered into the raffle because you bought tickets, you guys can leave the stage and go to the back. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much, you guys. And I believe the bar is still open as well, which is great. Uh, with uh, the, you can keep coming, you can come. It's not, I, I can talk over. Uh, the fabulous, only available at Northwest Passages event, Tower. Tonight goes to Tracy Otterhalt. Ta-da, -da, there you go. Right there, right in the front row. And then the, also the poster, and this is where Rob would tell you that our graphic designer had a little too much to drink. We call this the War Hall. Uh, this one goes to Lisa Norfolk, if she is here. Dun-dun-dun-dun, right there, dun dun da. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Um, the, there are a number of, uh, number of events coming up that I said that I would talk to you about before. I could click and put them up here, but I don't have the capability to psychically move that stuff around. But I can tell you that the next event is at the Spokane, 